What's up, everyone? I'm so happy to be back on the show. I've been gone for so long. I'm just <laughs> Maggie. It feels like it's been months, and it's only been what a week and a half, two weeks. Really, it feels to me like it's been months too, because I'm allowed to say this now because they allowed me to share on social media while I, why I have been away and where I was. I was in in Thailand, in Bangkok specifically, and I was there for the Alien set visit. It's the new Noah Hawley show, and that's the extent of what I'm allowed to tell you. But it it feels like I've been gone for a month because of like the time travel aspect oh, of wow. that type of traveling. It, it's the longest uh, it's the longest flight I've I've ever done in my life. And you I, live to tell the tale. <laughs> I was gonna say like I feel I feel like an old lady. Like my back is achy and stuff from sitting on a plane for that long. But but I I survived and it was lovely. And I posted lots of pictures if you want to see from my my sightseeing there. And then, Vera, I'm so jealous. I, I pet it and it ate out of my hands in the most gentle way imaginable. It was adorable. And, you know, sometime in the future, I'll be able to share all the wonderful information I learned about the new show. And trust me, you are going to want to hear it all. I can't wait. I also can't wait for our lineup today, Maggie, because it's especially horror heavy. And you know how that makes me feel. <laughs> We had to roll out all the horror things for you now that you're back. <laughs> my, for my big return, I appreciate that. Um, the first item on our agenda today is a brand new The Blair Witch Project movie. So this is happening with Lionsgate and Blumhouse. And I've got a, I got a couple quotes here that maybe I'll read. I will read them. Lionsgate film chair Adam Fogelson announced this news and he said... I have been incredibly fortunate to work with Jason, as in Jason Blum, many times over the years. We forged a strong relationship on The Purge when I was at Universal, and we launched STX with his film The Gift. There is no be there is no one better at this genre than the team at Blumhouse. He continued by saying, we are thrilled to kick this partnership off with a new vision for Blair Witch that will reintroduce this horror classic for a new generation. I have so many questions about that last statement, Maggie. <laughs> I, hate, I hate asking things like, do you think we need another Blair Witch movie? Because like, what, what do we really need, if you know what I mean by that? But what, what do you think that reintroducing the Blair Witch franchise for a new generation might look like? And does that potential vision for it excite you? I mean, I'm excited that we're going to get to revisit this franchise and I, I am more excited that it seems like they're going to be updating it for like a modern audience. And I think that was where a lot of my reservations initially were when I saw that they were doing a new Blair Witch movie because so much of what makes that movie work is that it's set in the 90s and there's a lot of technological, you know, disadvantages at play uh, for the, the folks that are, you know, in the woods. And so I'm curious to know if they're going to work in TikTok as an aspect to this and not like specifically TikTok, something like that, because I have taken a lot of joy in the people who have been creating horror stories on TikTok over the last couple of years where they're like experiencing things in their woods or there's weird screens. Mm. And like, there's a lot of stuff that horror fans have played with on TikTok that have already reminded me of the Blair Witch and like playing it as actually happening to them and like the audience reacting to it is thinking that they're actually seeing like a supernatural experience that somebody is dealing with over like a span of years now, but it's really just a story someone's been telling. So that's where my mind initially went. There's so much, so much you can do with social media and playing into the same tropes that the Blair Witch kind of perfected. So when you just said TikTok, I feel like my face soured. Yep, I saw it. <laughs> Like so, something about leaning into TikTok specifically, I fear loses the texture of the original Blair Witch and the original uh, found footage movies that caught on at that period. But then the more you explained, and when my brain rationalizes this whole idea and what they would need to do to reintroduce Blair Witch to a younger, newer audience, like you do need to play into how they're using this kind of technology and how they're sharing stories and how they're watching this kind of footage. So it does feel inevitable that they're going to go that they're going to go that kind of route, at least. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like. I feel like there is potential in what specifically you just said, because I've watched a couple of those videos, you know, on my own too, where, where someone's like walking through the wood, like, what am I going to find? And I need to watch to the end of the video to see what they're going to find. Exactly. I, I just, 
I feel like I'm not going to have maximum faith in a new Blair Witch movie, even though I do like, I like Blumhouse a lot. I like Lionsgate mm -hmm. a lot. I'm not going to have maximum faith in this idea until I know who's writing and directing it. And then, then maybe I will warm up to it a bit more. And also I, I, uh, I wanted to read this one. Everything is entertainment said, I liked Adam Wingard's take. So I wouldn't mind seeing what they come up with now. So this is a, a discourse that was happening on Twitter over the week. And I forget who started it, but someone had tweeted something to the effect of, I can't wait for, for like this new movie to come out. And then everybody to be like, well, that 2016 movie was actually really good. It's, I think it does have a rather low score on the tomato meter, but I am a big believer that that movie did not get the reception it deserved. And, you know, I could come up with a million reasons why it maybe wasn't as as strongly embraced as I thought it should have been. But I think that's an excellent new addition to the Blair Witch franchise. Yeah. One, that, one that I highly recommend people watching if you haven't watched it yet, or maybe if you didn't like it when it first came out, give it another shot. I thought that was a pretty high quality. I'm not even going to call it like a big spin on that concept. It just, fe it feels like, like that movie did exactly what they're saying, which is it brought the Blair Witch Project to, you know, a new generation while still appeasing fans of the original. So I thought they did that really well. So maybe if they take what Adam Wingard did and take it another step forward, this could be a good idea. But admittedly, I've got some nerves with this one. Definitely. Yeah, I really hope they lean into like the new version of found footage through social media because there's such a, there's such a fun aspect to that that I think could appease to a younger demographic while also still kind of pulling upon those of us who grew up with the original Blair Witch Project. When you say this might be a hard question to answer, but when you say the new version of found footage, how much are you looking at it as found footage versus screen life, if that makes any sense. Because it does feel like this generation's found footage has kind of become screen life. It has become screen life, but I, I guess it's the way that it's presented. There's definitely people, at least on like TikToks that I have seen where they present what they're showing, like, I got this footage the other day, here's what I'm showing versus like, I'm outside live and this is happening to me. So there's that that aspect of like, I found this footage and this thing's happening here, I'm mm -hmm. putting it on. And it depends on how like the, the meta aspect of the storytelling, because I still remember the Blair Witch Project. I think they went on Good Morning America in the 90s when that came out and they played it so straight, like this was actually found mm -hmm. footage they had found. I remember that really stuck with me. And I was like six years old when I was watching that. So that aspect, I think playing into the meta of it could be really fun. Just in case anybody doesn't know yet, stream life is, uh, I, I guess I'll call it a form of found footage, but I guess mm -hmm. it doesn't always have to be found footage, if that makes sense. But it's when a movie takes place entirely on your computer screen. So for example, Unfriended, highly recommend that. Host, highly recommend that. I think there's really great potential in that particular format. And given the fact that most everyone nowadays is attached to their screen, screen life does seem like a potential route for this franchise to take that, you know, might make it feel a little fresh and also hugely digestible considering that's how we all operate nowadays. So Maybe that is the path they will take. We will find out. Hopefully we'll get more updates on this project in the near future because I want to know more now. All right. Next on our agenda today, a Fallout review. I'm so excited about this, Maggie. Mm -hmm. I always like prefacing reviews that I do based on popular source material by explaining my connection to the source material. So I need to tell you all, I have not played Fallout. So I jumped into this series as a total newcomer. And that being said, one of my absolute favorite things about this show is how incredibly well-written the world building is in particular in the first episode. I actually think the first episode of Fallout might be one of my favorite episodes of television, definitely in recent years. And I might even be able to say ever when I rewatch it enough to get it up to those heights. But they do such a good job of establishing, I guess for the most part, three primary characters, three key organizations, three key locations, 
And that's not easy to do in such a minimal amount of screen time, but they set that foundation so strong and then build on it in such interesting ways. And then they find the absolute best actors to fill those key roles. Yes. Of course, we have Walton Goggins, who seemingly can do no wrong. And in the role of, of the ghoul, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know how he truly feels, but I watch a performance like that and think like this dude is loving this opportunity and loving the chance to take it to an 11. And I, I do think that kind of enthusiasm and willingness to go there heavily impacts my experience watching him mm -hmm. perform in that role. So I thought he was exceptional. I really loved Aaron Moten's work as, as Maximus. He's a member of the Brotherhood of, uh, of the Steel. And he now, now, now I'm like, I'm also concerned that I'm saying things wrong because <laughs> in one of my interviews, I accidentally said power suit and pa instead of power armor. Now people are giving me so much shit for it. Um, <laughs> anyway, I thought he was great. Matt, so whereas the ghoul and Ella Purnell's Lucy, I think come with like a very strict routine and set of rules that they abide by. He's kind of in the middle and a little more difficult to track. And I thought his performance was pretty exceptional at drawing you into his headspace, into his world, and taking you along for the ride as he figures things out. So he was one of the toughest characters for me to like put a finger on, especially at the beginning of the season. But I thought he did that really effectively. And then Ella Purnell is Lucy. Pitch so good. Pitch perfect, Maggie. Pitch perfect. I thought she was exceptional at balancing the, the comedic tone of this show with also the severity of her situation. And those, they're two completely different things that are very difficult to pair together, but she, she couldn't have found a more effective balance than where she lands. I'll stop my rambling there and hand it over to you because I believe you've watched how many? Episodes? <laughs> yes. I had fully planned to watch like it this weekend and I didn't realize they were going to switch to the binge model so quickly. So I was like, well, I did not get to those screeners in time. So I watched the first episode last night in preparation of today's episode and I loved it. I was so surprised by how much I loved it. I was surprised that it was as freaky as it was. There's a lot of little plot points in season one or episode one of the season that I was just like, oh, okay, we're growing there. We're exploring these things. Uh, I was really surprised by how funny it was. There were so many like unironically hilarious moments, even though they were played like completely straight and the utopian dystopian vibes of the vault were really compelling the the patiche of it all was really fun to kind of get invested in and then see it utterly destroyed within a matter of, of minutes uh and that i really enjoyed and i am already ready to keep watching <laughs> like as soon as we're done with dailies i'm going to be putting that on in the background because it I don't blame me. you it's it me it's really good. It continues to be pretty exceptional too. I do think the the back four episodes, the story might not be as streamlined as the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think I wound up I wound up feeling the need to rewatch the back half just to fully process everything. But I still think it's incredibly strong. I do have a question for you. I know you talked about the first episode really laying things out well for somebody who might not know a lot about the game. I only have like very tangential like knowledge of the game world. But as the season continues to unfold new aspects and layers to this universe, did you feel at all like you were in the dark with anything or do they continue to do really well at balancing game lovers and newcomers. I definitely didn't feel feel in the in the dark. My criticism my criticism of the back half is I mean mostly mostly you know dialogue and structural things where I wasn't quite sure certain key moments were packing the same punch as the first half but they were they were still they were still rich thoughtful and engrossing it's just you know I went from one through four where I'm like peak 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 and then I'm like oh I say like a little dip little dip but I I mean it in in the slightest sense because where without spoiling anything of course where they land at the end of season one like it it rattled it rattled me and again I do think that all of the lead performances are really great and I also want to shout out Moises Arias who plays Norm Lucy's brother who at the very oh, beginning God. of the show 
I guess I just, my brain automatically boxed him into, oh, like supporting, supporting role. He'll pop up every now and then. His arcs, his arc wound up being one of the most fascinating of the bunch to me. But my absolute favorite character arc in season one of Fallout was Ella Purnell's as, as Lucy. And, you know, like for, for better, for better or worse, as this show might show, like the idea of, of, the golden rule and, and like doing to others what you would want done to you. It, it just, I don't know. I, I feel like day to day, I always operate that way. And I appreciate that mentality and watching someone so full of life. And so, and so strong in her belief of that, watching that composure crack slowly every single step of the way and and watching certain extremes that that character in particular is is put through like it it hurts it it hurts because i also think and this is why i appreciate genre storytelling in particular you know like sci-fi horror stuff like that i often find that it could be i'm not going to say easier but maybe more powerful to process process our own reality through those extremes. So through her extreme mindset and watching it deteriorate, you start to look at the reality of the world around you and, and you see all of those things more clearly. And hmm, that's interesting. Uh, the, the show is very entertaining, but being able to see those things clearly kind of like hurts more <laughs> and, ho and hopefully teaches humanity a lesson to, you know, to be to be kinder and maybe understand other people's circumstances a bit better, but I just, this the show really rocked me to my core. And I, I had high hopes, but it rocked me to my core more than I thought it would. I have to say that was the thing in episode one that I saw being set up that I was the most excited to see, which is seeing Lucy experience the world outside of the vault and having all of that hope and promise and belief kind of stripped away slowly and i think there is something really fun to be seen there and that exploration uh, so i think that's the thing that i'm most excited for and i have to say i was really proud of myself there was next stuff and i got through it when when oh. monty gets stabbed in the neck i was like oh 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 but i got through it so <laughs> yeah there, there's like really a lot of high quality work on display there's so oh, much good the big, big shout out to the the costumes. Yeah, the crafts teams are exceptional. Like the the level of detail. One one thing I always appreciate in in uh, in the design work of a show that's so heavily focused on on extreme world building is when I know everything that I'm seeing serves a purpose. And you know, these are things that I'll probably discover more and more on rewatches. But but I felt that to be true even on one watch. Like looking around, everything made sense. Something wasn't just there to be like, oh, like we're adding like a flashy apocalyptic uh, thing here just for the sake of filling out the world. It, it felt like everything belonged, like everything had history and everything served a purpose. And I do think that's a, a pretty big accomplishment right there. Absolutely. I definitely think it's got some uh, Emmy, Emmy potential in the works. Um, I like the sound of that. I will repeat. I think it has Emmy potential. Emmy, what you said, Emmy potential in the work. Emmy potential. Oh yeah. I'm just repeating it to manifest it because I want <laughs> to get uh, get the praise it deserves. With that, we'll roll into our final topic of the day, which is another hard topic. I am happy about that. It is the Speak No Evil trailer. So, just in case you do not know what Speak No Evil is, the synopsis reads. When an American family is invited to spend the weekend at the idyllic country, idyllic a country estate of a charming British family they befriended on vacation, what begins as a dream holiday soon warps into a snarled psychological nightmare. So the American couple is played by Scoot McNary and Mackenzie Davis. And then the other couple is played by James McAvoy, of course, and Ashling Franciosi, who is exceptional in everything I see her in. This is a this is an A plus cast right here, but I feel I, I'm curious to see the variety of responses to this trailer because I feel like if you've seen the Danish original, like it, it's hard it's hard to watch this knowing what they're in for. Mm -hmm. The 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 original film is one of those one and dones for me. Like I saw it once and I will never watch yep. it. 
but of course I will watch this this remake here. That that was one of the hardest watches and hardest movies to like decompress after watching that I've I've ever experienced in my life. Hugely, hugely disturbing. And I'm curious to see how how well this iteration hits those levels and if they even try to hit those levels because I do feel like sometimes with remakes you could see things getting toned down a little the trailer is very intense but we're not going to know until we see the full thing how dark they're going to go with this yeah I'm really curious too especially since it wasn't that long ago that we got the Danish speak no evil is what 2022 very, very recent. Very recent. Um, and yeah, like yourself, it was a one and done. I had a horrific stomach ache after watching this one. It was just, it was a lot. And I am curious if it will be toned down for American audiences, because we've seen that quite often that films in other countries will go all out with the, the horror and the gore and the, the horrible feelings attached mm -hmm. to those things. And then it doesn't also translate when it comes here and gets remade. So I don't know. I'm curious. I'm really curious to see how people react to this one, because I do think the original Speak No Evil is one of the better horror films I've seen. Yeah. Easily one of the most horrific horror films I've ever, <laughs> I've ever seen. It's a, it's up there with um, Martyrs for me. I feel like a lot of people watching know how I feel about Martyrs and that, that movie, that, that movie like ruined me for a week after seeing it. And this one had a, a somewhat similar effect, maybe not to that extent, but it was, it was pretty high up there. I wanted to speak no evil completely blind. I was just picking films at a festival because I was trying to watch more <laughs> foreign films and that was a mistake. I was not emotionally prepared. <laughs> Yeah, you know, if I watch a movie like that, I'm fine having having those like super dark feelings as long as the movie earns it. And th that one most certainly did. And I hope this one does as well. The one warning, and I'm curious if me knowing the first movie is what's making this worse, but it does feel like this trailer reveals a lot. So I might, I might suggest to anyone out there who has not seen the original Speak No Evil, maybe don't watch the trailers before seeing this new one if you want to be totally surprised. But, you know, then again, I'll also admit, maybe I'm only picking up on certain things because I know what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, could, yeah. could be hit or miss in that respect. Yeah, I would agree with that sentiment. I feel like I knew what was happening because I knew what was happening. Yeah. Um, I also want to just reference Jeremy's chat here. I've missed Mackenzie Davis. She hasn't really been in anything since Dark Fate. So Mackenzie Davis was on Collider Ladies Night fairly recently. You can go watch that after you watch this episode of Collider Dailies for an exceptional show that deserved way more credit than it got. Station Eleven, you can watch it on Max. Cannot recommend it enough. And she she's always good in everything, but that's one of my favorite performances of hers. It is good performance. I'm excited to see James McAvoy back to doing horror again. It's been a hot second since he's done any horror films. Do you know his last horror film off the top of your head? Not off the top of my head. I knew it yesterday, but today it just went straight out of my head. My, uh, I mean, uh, there there might have been something since this. Um, what, what, what's his uh, Frankenstein movie with Daniel Radcliffe? Daniel Radcliffe? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now I'm going to have to look it up so I don't. Victor Frankenstein. There we go. Hey. There's too many Frankenstein movies. It's hard to yeah, remember. I mean, there is. Ones. I'm not mad about it. They're, I love that. As long as they're good, I'm here for them. Um, we yeah. have a, a super chat from Mike K that is uh, giving out some more James McAvoy love. Whether or not this movie is any good, I am happy to see James McAvoy return to the big screen. I'm always happy to see James McAvoy on the big screen. I like him a lot. There's many people in this. Like, really, this, enti uh, this entire ensemble always delivers... Um, Adam dropped it in, in the, in the, uh, in the private chat, Adam, you should have, you knew this, you should have shouted mm -hmm. it out in the chat, in like the main chat. He said split James McAvoy is exceptional in split. That's one of my favorite recent horror movies, actually. Yes. That's a good one. Yep. So All right. With that, we are wrapping up this edition of Collider Dailies. Before we say goodbye, Maggie. Promote something. Promote something you worked real hard on. I have a really fun interview I dropped this morning with the cast of Ghosts. I so if you're it. a fan of that show, you can go check that out on Collider.com. It's a great uh, kind of combination of roundtables that I got to do at the Library of Congress this week, which was such a great 
combination of my two passions for entertainment and for history. So it was a really great experience. And I, I talk about all of it and uh, have some really great quotes from the cast for what's happening this season and maybe things they want to happen in season four. I knew you were going to say that. I was so excited you were going to say that because that is another cast. A plus across the board. Lovely people, hugely talented people. And I want the best for them and for that show. I will take an opportunity to promote Surprise Surprise, some ladies' night interviews. <laughs> we had two actually go up last week. It was Nell Tiger Free for the first Omen, which I'm so excited to see so widely embraced. And she is a powerhouse in it. So if you want some insight into what went into that performance, I highly recommend checking that out. Then soon after that, we dropped on with Camila Mendez from Musica, and she kind of explained what's been happening since the end of Riverdale and why she's producing more and how all of that paved the way to Musica, which is really a, a, an exceptional, highly unique romantic con. Like, if you think you've had enough of love triangles, I highly recommend giving that movie a go for a multitude of reasons, but I feel like I'm spoiling the interview now. <laughs> One of the things that she said she was most proud of in terms of her contribution to that movie was spicing up the female roles. And she does something with them that actually makes it a really, like a really captivating and honest love triangle scenario, you know, while still keeping things fun and entertaining and, and quite fresh. So check that out. And then tomorrow, tomorrow on this channel in the morning, the Ella Purnell Ladies Night for Fallout will drop. And if you are a fan of Fallout and Yellow Jackets, you will not want to miss it. So with that, I will say have a lovely weekend and we'll see you Monday morning with a new episode of Collider Dailies.